This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist and activist Swoon about her life, her work, and her passions. Born Caledonia Curry, the artist has moved from pasting art on the streets of New York to acclaimed gallery and museum show that feature her large-scale wood-like prints and cut paper collages. She is passionate about social change and has been active in supporting community redevelopment nationwide, as well as in Haiti. At the end of the episode, I'll be taking a look at some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, the healing power of art with Swoon. Curry, Callie, uh, aka Swoon, thank you for uh, joining us today on the Art Sense podcast. Absolutely, I, hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, so you know, a lot of times with artists, what what I like to start with is if, if you're at a brunch and uh, somebody sat next uh, next to you that uh, had never met you before, and um, they asked you what what do you do, and you say you're an artist, how would you explain? How would you describe your work? to someone who's never met you before? This is a hard one because sometimes I, I, I had a real wake up call a few years ago when I met somebody and she says, what do you do? And I was trying to explain it. And she just looked at me with the most compassionate blank stare and said, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, Oh, this is confusing. Unless, you know, I was so used to talking to everybody who was like, oh, I'm already an artist. We already know what you're talking about. Um, so I have, like, had to think about, okay, like, what about if, if it's just, like, a person who's like, yeah, I'm talking to you, but I have zero, you know, like, don't talk to me in that, like, insider art language. Um, and so in that case, I think the thing that I usually say is that I'm an artist. My work is about people. Um, and that I... You know, I, I make portraits, that's kind of the, the main thing that I do, but then those portraits kind of grow out into a lot of other projects, um, and then I still will sort of just describe the projects. I'll be like, you know, I've done community rebuilding with folks. I think a lot about how art can help us, you know, repair and heal in times of crisis, uh, and then... You know, and then I talk about right now I'm working on things like stop motion animation and trying to learn film and storytelling. And so I basically kind of took that initial seed of like portraiture and looking at people and and, you know, said, like, what are all of the ways that this can um, that I can kind of like it's almost like, you know, you take a prism and you just like turn it over and look at it from all the different angles. Your start was very tr- uh, traditional. I think I remember hearing that you said that you were, were really attracted to painting. You went to art school. I, I guess the, the big turning point for you was when you you took your art to the streets. How did you go from the studio to the streets in the first place? Because the, your work, the notoriety of your work brought you back into the galleries, right? So right. How, at what point did you say, you know what, this art belongs to the world it needs to be site specific and it needs to be here. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I got to New York city and, you know, I was like a teenager before the internet. I was like, you know, grew up in not the world's smallest town, but you know, we certainly didn't have a ton of culture. And, and then I got to New York city and I was like, sorry, I'm crying an egg. That's okay. <laughs> I got to New York city and it just blew my mind. You know, everything about it, the, the power, the scale, the art that was on the walls, and also kind of the sense that this was the greatest artwork. That, like, my first impression was, like, oh, my God, all these artists, all these modernists, all these, you know, everyone, feeling that everyone was responding to the city and that you could see that visually in their work. And then and then kind of the second impression that I got was, like, oh, no, this this is the artwork. Like, this is the place. This is the thing. And, and I felt like I didn't want to, you know, start by kind of visually imitating the city, I was like, let me just, let me just go straight there. You know, because again, I was like a teenager when, I mean, who knows what, like, teenagers that grow up 
with the internet, it's not like they're necessarily studying like art history. You know, maybe their exposure to art. Who knows? It could be similarly limited because now people, you know, it's like you can really get deep down into a niche and you have all the information. So you know, who knows? But I certainly felt at the time like my whole concept of art it was like a painting on a wall. And then I got to New York and just had that totally exploded. Whenever someone sees your work, you know, it's I think it's easily identifiable because, I mean, there's strong mark making. It looks like a, a block print uh, of some sort, which you don't normally see wheat pasted on a wall on a street in Manhattan. But it kind of leaps off the, the walls. But, you know, it's also the, the content beyond how you make your work. It's what your work is. How would you describe some of the, the main themes that are, are threads that are carried through your work? There's kind of like a lot of different ways that I'm thinking about art making. Mm -hmm. um, and within each of them, I think that there are some kind of common kind of themes or practices of of, of looking deeply into ourselves, you know, which sounds um, kind of obvious, I think, in a way. But I, I think once you start to, to really do it, to really kind of try to think about you know, what, what, why is it that we need to avoid suffering so much? And what are all these things that we need to do to avoid suffering? And how does that show up in our lives? Like, once you really get down deep into it, you realize that, like, looking deeply into yourself is kind of no small challenge. And so I think that, that like, trying to have a certain um, kind of, like, willingness to peer into um, human nature is is definitely, I think, one of the main themes Um in my work and then I think also the the sort of the feeling that you show up in a world and everybody hands you the rules and tells you that this is how it's this is how it is and that it's kind of upon us to reinvent that and so I you know I think that that's also kind of a theme in my work of like everything from going out into the street and being like okay I'm going to um you know kind of shift how I understand their work needs to be seen to People being like, well, artists can't, you know, be part of the rebuilding after an earthquake because that's too dangerous and you don't have the skill set. Or, you know, any of the things that I've worked on over the years where I feel like I kind of looked at, you know, or looking at my sort of family taboos, you know, the generations of intergenerational trauma of saying, you can't heal that, you about it. You know, anytime you take a look at something that you were handed and be like, no, let's let's reinvent this for us. Um, I think that like that energy is also like one of the energies that I feel is most alive within my work. Tell me about the power of art to heal, because when I look at your work, I feel like there's some some certain parts of your work where you are working through emotion, your own personal traumas, and then you know you mentioned Haiti. I'd love to, you know, have you describe the, the work you've done down there, which is amazing. You know, can you speak to arts of power to heal? How, how is that? I know, right? It's like a little mysterious. And you're like, well, where does it live? Does the power to heal live in the meditative time that we take while we're making it? Does it live in the feeling that we're expressing something and our need to be understood? Um, or does it live in the kind of magic of taking something that didn't used to be and creating something <clears throat> from that and the feeling, you know, like if you if you get a cut and the cut feels, there's the sense that something miraculous has happened. That something that was destroyed or hurt or harmed or you know torn apart is now starting to mend itself and you're like, whoa, you know, my body can do that. How can it do that? And I think when we participate in that kind of activity, you know, like in Haiti after the earthquake, um, I did some work with a small village called Komie, and we all got together and built a community center, and we, um, you know, then went on to build two homes, and, and it's been a very long-term process. But the, the initial building project, I remember one of our, um, like, kind of dearest friends there who we made, you know, from working all those years, he said one of the most important things about the building of the community center was the feeling that while everything was kind of coming apart and people were still like out of work and you know the supply chains were disrupted and everyone was really feeling depressed and feeling deeply disempowered that we were now suddenly 
every person in the village was involved in this thing. We were all working together. And, you know, there was money was flowing in because we decided that it was important that people get paid for their work because the economic disruption was part of the disaster. And so there was, you know, there was money, there was energy, but like most importantly, there was everyone putting their hands on something and being like, we're together, we're here, and we're and we're and we're going to make it better. And and I think you know, art is the thing that I think can sometimes catalyze that because we're like, okay, well, what should we do? What should we do? And there's something about having this activity of art, which can almost sometimes be like the kind of the ben- the beneficent Trojan horse. Like it, Philly Mural Arts is one of my favorite organizations. They'll have groups of people who who are um, at odds with each other paint murals together because. They found that if you're just like doing something with your hands and you're focused on this third thing, you can have these kind of conversations that you wouldn't necessarily be able to have if you were just staring at each other across the table. Um, and so I feel like the, the sort of healing power of art is kind of the ghost in the machine in the sense that you're like, well, where does it live? Is it in the meditative? Is it in the conversations that it starts? Is it in the feeling of togetherness? Or is it in the alone time that you get? You know, it's, it lives in all of these different places. Um, but somehow it, it is there. You've done work not only in Haiti, but in different communities. And, you know, it's a collaborative experience where you make the community part of the process. Um, it reminds me of work that some other street artists have done like Hassan Han and JR. And I've heard both of them talk about how important it is to go back to these communities to maintain relationships. Mm-hmm. Can, can you kind of talk about your experience there? Yeah. Um, first of all, shout out to those guys. I'm, I'm a huge fan um, of Hassan Han and JR. Um, and, you know, I think the thing for me that I discovered um, and somebody really articulated it. One of my art- my collaborators really articulated it early on when I was questioning, well, what did we really, what did we really achieve in Haiti? You know, there's there was so much devastation, and we were able to do this little piece. Um, and he was like, yeah, but ultimately, what you have to recognize is that the the work is 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 not just you know it's not just about this one building or this one thing. You built this relationship, and now the relationship is what. Um, you know, part of what is being cared for. And so um, that's why the, the work in Haiti has gone on for, you know, over a decade. Um, even amidst people saying like, oh, you're being a white savior, you're doing all these things. Um, because I think that, you know, sometimes people confuse work like the work I'm doing with, you know, somebody kind of taking a school trip and being like, oh, these people don't know how to deal with their lives, so I'm going to help them. And in fact, that's not at all what was going on what happened is that there was a major like earth-shaking catastrophe and um then me and my community became involved with this other community and then once once that involvement started it it really very much felt like the right thing to do was to let the relationship be a relationship to let it live out um you know as long as as long as we felt like we were connected to keep working together and as long as people kept presenting ideas of like hey let's do this and let's do that and you know we we started an after school um program that's run by some local folks there and one of the people that we worked with as a teenager has really stepped into this role and now he's becoming like a very good teacher and he's he's making different proposals to us and will you help me do this and help me do that and we're like oh my god this is so cool like just to be in a position of of helping this person um you know, develop their own initiative and be in their own place and we can just kind of be like his sort of cheerleaders and his assistants and the people who, you know, like when you think about the people in our lives, for example, the, you know, the teachers that that I had or the people who stood up for me or made sure that I had opportunities, you know, it just feels very similar. It's like over time, the relationship, you know, continues and it kind of becomes things like that. You're like, oh, right, like, you know, I'm, I'm involved in in someone's life and I'm involved in someone's life very much in the ways that people were involved in my life when I was young and I was growing. Just talking to you, I'm just taken aback by your emotional maturity. (laughs) It just seems like at, at the core of who you are, it's like the art is just second to your worldview of healing and that the art just kind of manifests itself from that. 
Let me, let me ask you this. Your work started as something very ephemeral, right? Something that would wasn't intended to be permanent. It couldn't hold up. But now, you know, in the conventional art world, asked to, to be in a gallery, you're asked to be collected. You know, do you ever feel conflicted about the ephemeral versus the permanent? Not really, actually. Um, you know, I think that the, I love the ephemeral, but I also feel like... Um, you know, I I think like the the things I think that the I always had like even when I was putting these pieces out on the street, the piece itself was ephemeral, but the record of the piece was permanent. I always had uh, you know a print of it back home, <laughs> you know, and so people would say, "Oh, this is very pure gesture you're making," and I was like, "Not really." Like I I have a copy back home, and you know the other thing that I've learned over the years is like, um. You know, I've I've become connected with this artist Judy Chicago, who's like a you know incredible mentor for a lot of women, um, and she talks about this concept, which is very important I think to understand, called female erasure, which is that over the generations, there's it's not that women were never, um, you know, never allowed to be artists. Certainly, there was very little encouragement, very little support. Like the structures, the opportunities weren't as much there, but but. Kind of maybe even more importantly, even when they were there, the sort of people would be like, "Okay, great, you did it, bye," and 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 those things would just tend to like over and over again, kind of fall through the cracks, or just become kind of fodder for the inspiration of someone else's project, but not ever really kind of remain. And so she has taught me that like that like the thing that I'm doing as a woman artist in this moment is not really something that we've seen in like how many generations of of like of the western art world and so it kind of matters for me to say like this there should be a permanence to this people should know that uh you know that that women can have a fully realized creative life and can be totally outside the box and inventive and creating at scale and doing all of these things you know and our generation is really showing that like there's tons of women really showing up in that way but to judy's point she's like don't feel safe don't just assume that um, just because you're you're okay and you're having success now, don't just assume that your culture won't, you know, have a conservative spasm and close in around you and erase what you did. Um, and so and so, do take that time to archive and to make sure that your contribution is is there for for future generations. You know, in your work, I I see you making. There are some pieces that wind up. Uh, you know, because of the nature of the block print, uh, your ability to make uh, make a component of a work that winds up being reused, that yeah. it's like there are I- individual pieces that you're able to come back and reassemble and reinterpret. Many times in mm-hmm. many ways. Right. Yeah. And so it's like the, you know, these pieces are reincarnated and reinterpreted. You know, can you kind of talk about when when did you first start figuring that out and and kind of what that process means to you? Um, well, when I first started it, I became really obsessed with block printing because um, I was really I was really kind of obsessed with language. Also, I think I was at the I was at a point where I think I always knew that I would become an artist, but there was like maybe I was writing, like maybe writing was like kind of really. Um, competing for my attention or, or my love or whatever and so so I was of course thinking about words and thinking about language and um and when I first discovered block printing and I was making these little little pieces and I was like oh my god this is this is feels like spoken language that you have in in any given sentence you have a sound and that sound gets repeated and it gets combined and recombined in these various ways and then through the combination of these very simple kind of series of sounds and series of symbols, we can do this intense communication. And and it and it felt to me like I just wanted to play at what that felt like. And I was like, oh, well, if I make all these different blocks and then I combine them this way and I combine them that way and I layer them this way and that way, I was like, will I feel like what it feels like at the level of, you know, creating language? Um, and it also felt like I was like, oh, is this how I try to find my own language? Um, you know, because every artist ultimately finds their own language to speak and find, finds the language that feels like it's theirs. And so for me, it kind of just felt like that process of being like, how do we learn to, how do we create our own language through repetition, through, um, 
you know, kind of the reuse of these of these variables and these elements in, in, in a thousand different ways. And so I love I love that part. Um, and it also kind of gives me a chance. Like I don't have to have done it right the first time. I can be like, what about this in blue? What about this in blue with orange? What about this in blue ripped in half? What about this in blue and orange ripped in half? You know, like I can just keep asking that question, that sort of relentlessness of the mind to want to know how many different ways this thing can happen. You can answer that in printmaking. Yeah. Well, whenever I hear you talk, it always sounds like you have like a half dozen projects going on. Yeah. And, and so in my mind, uh, you are kind of uh, a field general leading like a, you know, a whole platoon of, of <laughs> assistants, right? And so how, how many people do you, are you currently collaborating with? I mean, you have a studio practice, but you also have uh, your hands in community projects. Tell me about collaboration. Like, have, have you, have you always felt like a leader? Um, no, I, you know, this is interesting because I do feel like a leader recently. I really do. And I'm really stepping into that, but I was a shy child, like cripple, cripplingly shy when I was really small. And so the idea that I would ever like step into a leadership role, I mean, I think you, you couldn't have convinced me of that. Um, and, but now I really feel it and I'm really like, oh, this, there are ways in which not only in which in which this is the thing that's called for that like i need to step up and i need to step into this um and so and so i certainly always haven't but it's certainly something that's sort of happening kind of more and more i think in the last few years although i think what i found very early on is that my leadership consisted of having an idea and just really wanting everyone else to know about it and be into it and be like let's do this it, that was kind of the form my leadership took was sort of more like a very unbridled enthusiasm that was very like come on guys like wouldn't it be cool you know <laughs> like that that I was like that moment at the party where you're like everybody let's jump in the pool or whatever like that was kind of the beginning I think for me was that tendency and then you know and then slowly I found all the different ways that collaboration can take place and so you know <clears throat> I think one question that people have for me a lot is about yeah, like what are the different ways that people are involved in your project? So, for example, I just got off the phone yesterday with some folks that I collaborate with in a way that, you know, I'm just like a small creative piece. They're they're running this whole project and they've just kind of asked me for some thoughts and ideas and I, you know, I participate in my tiny little way and they they, you know, they kind of like keep the keep the whole thing going and they're creative directed. And but somehow we have this really great collaboration that's lasted many years. And then I'll go to my studio where I have people who are, you know, hired as assistants and they're, you know, they're they'll do very specific things um, in very specific ways. And so that's like, you know, kind of making, uh, you know, making a technical um, piece happen. And then there is, you know, my nonprofit, uh, the Heliotrope Foundation, where, you know, I'm collaborating in, in this kind of other sense where um, the project that I'm working on right at the moment is I'm trying to see, I've been helping um, this, there's a woman there who I think is incredible and she does like the real deal community-based work and I'm trying to figure out how I can help her um, move into some larger properties and, and kind of take her project to the scale that I think it can be at. Um, and so in that way, it's like I'm both in leadership and in service. Um, and so, you know, and then other times you'll have a project where you'll sit down with, with friends and be like, what should we do? And you, you come up with the idea together and there's tons of back and forth, um, you know, and then there's other roles where it's like clearly you're the boss and you're asking people for this and that. So there's like so many different ways that working with others happens. I, I think I heard you say earlier that uh, you were working with some stop motion. Do I remember seeing an uh, an ad a couple of years, uh, like four or five years back, with like an Alicia Keys song for that was stop motion, yeah. right? Um, that actually, I didn't do that animation. I I was Alicia just asked me to to be part of that campaign for her album, which I was really excited about because I really love her and I, you know, she's a she's a collector and she's you know just she's just the real deal and in, in, in a lot a lot of ways a really truly creative human. And, um, and so she asked me to be a part of it. And so I, I worked with this like kind of larger team. Um, 
but um but then i also have my i have my own film work which is me kind of hand building um uh you know these like kind of narratives or at the moment i'm 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 actually working out how to work um how to work in written narrative like you know actually building a story and kind of working in more of a traditional film way so that's like a whole other i'm really it's so funny. I often feel like my kind of creative muse is like this little imp that I, or I don't know if imp is the right word, like a, <laughs> like a sprite, like the right. sort of, what's that word? Like a little fairy sprite in the right. forest that's like, you know, right. oh, you're going to, you're going to follow me now. And I'm like, where are we going? Right. Um, and so right now the little sprite is like running along after, uh, you know, me learning how to work with actors and me learning how to work with narrative story and me figuring out you know just kind of that whole world of how storytelling unfolds <clears throat> both visually but also you know in the emotional world of the sort of of, of actors and performance and um all that will this manifest itself as like a short art piece or are you thinking something that would have broader appeal i you know what i mean okay to be seen well, we don't really know yet, but this is the first time in my life where I kind of feel like I want to, I want to be out in the world with this. Like if there's a way for me to have the broadest appeal possible with this project that I'm forming, which is, you know, I'm still hesitant to even really say what it is. I understand. Um, but I, but I would, you know, it's like, I feel, I suddenly feel like I think I grew up, you know, in the arts and I was, you know, living on like rafts on rivers and being very off grid for like many many years and but you know then I was also it was about connecting with people in this other way you know it was always about connecting with people um even when it was kind of off grid and really wild and seemed um and seems you know very odd to a lot of people um but I think that right now you know because I've done all this work like I was saying around like intergenerational trauma and kind of healing in my family what I like really discovered in that process is that is that I I wish that I had known when I was a child the things that I want to communicate now, mm. and it just makes me want to 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 really and truly reach my young self and to be like if that could happen in the in a movie theater in the Midwest, then I would love that. You know, <laughs> right. I don't know if that, I'm ever going to really speak that language, but I I just certainly feel that I'm not averse to it at this point. So, so I, I have to ask then, what would you have said to six-year-old Callie? I would have said, your mom is, is really, really ill, and there are some reasons. And I'm really, I would have talked to her. I would have been like, hey, this is what's happening, and you can heal. Like, this isn't, I would have said to six-year-old Callie, you're not, this isn't like who you this doesn't mean that this is who you're going to be. You're not, your family's not cursed. This isn't like a foregone conclusion that everyone's going to end up, you know, screaming with psychosis in the street. This is some people who are deeply suffering. And, and if you guys could find a way to talk about it and reach out for help, it, it would be possible. It's not, it's not like a permanent thing. It's not, it's not a message about who you are. It's, it's a situation and it's a, and for whatever reason, you know, families hold silence. And so for whatever reason, you know, it's like sometimes you hear those messages and you're like, well, they're out there. And it's like, I don't know, somehow somehow I didn't get it. You know, somehow it never came to me. And so I think asking what are all the different ways that we can bring that message over and over again. I mean, I, I just find your, your story really courageous because the six-year-old Kelly didn't hear that. But somewhere along the way, somebody reassured you that it was going to be okay and that you could make, you know, make the world and your life, you can make it what you want to make it. Right. Yeah. At some point I went from feeling totally helpless and disempowered to feeling so empowered that I could build all the things that I'm working on. And that's a huge transition. So, you know, your artwork is, I, I think there's definitely, um, people would definitely think of your artwork as being feminine, but, do you feel like your artwork is feminist? I mean, I hear I hear us talking about you know empowerment, but what what do you think? Do would you? Yeah, well, you know, I think I I think I, I 
was on kind of a trajectory that I, I, I see sometimes around me where when I was young, I, I didn't want to even be thought of as feminist, I think because I understood that that would sort of, that that was a little bit vulnerable, that people were going to think like, oh, you know, she hates us or whatever, whatever. You know, I grew up around Fox News, and even though I didn't believe in it, it's still quite subconsciously scarring, actually. Um, and so, and so, you know, I think that what feels feminist to me today so, like, I, again, I was, to, to reference Judy Chicago, I just saw her speak the other day, and she said that, she said, when I was a young woman in the 60s in California, there were no women, almost no women who were respected in the mainstream art world except me. And she said, and how I got that respect was by being in drag, by hiding who I was and by showing up in this incredibly masculine way. And I totally identified with that. You know, when I... When I renamed myself and was out in the, out in the street, you know, making kind of, you know, I think what was pretty masculine work, I think, you know, when people didn't know that I was a woman and I didn't tell them, you know, some of it was just kind of funny and fun and I thought, well, it's not the point, it doesn't matter. But I think in another way, I implicitly knew that, like, there was a way in which, that, like, there was, there was a way in which that could, could be safer. On the other hand, once people did find out I was a woman, they were really they were really excited. I got an incredible amount of support for that. And people often say, you know, was it difficult? Um, and, and I often, you know, I say people were actually incredibly supportive of me being a female street artist when there were so few. Um, so, you know, I didn't feel the, I didn't feel that like level of kind of uh, glass ceiling until actually until later, until I got more, you know, obviously the glass ceiling is up a little higher. Um, and so I got into a place where I was like, oh, right, like, if I think in certain instances, if I was a male, I would be being treated differently, respected differently, you know, paid differently, all these things. Um, but so I think for me, what feminism means is, like, I made a piece a few years ago called the Medea, and it's a giant pink house, and it's splitting open, and it's showing this kind of spider creature that looks like very much like a vulva, it's like quite terrifying. Um, and then, and then when you pick up the telephones and these other domestic objects, there's this, um, you know, we're talking about stories about domestic violence and sexual abuse and mental illness and addiction and all of this kind of deeply intimate stuff that I think in previous generations was considered like things of the private world or the domestic sphere and kind of not serious and not to be respected, you know, in a kind of a Richard Sarah monumental sculpture kind of world. Um, and I love Richard Sarah, that's not to denigrate him at all, but just to say that that is not the only form of expression. And so for me to stand up and be like, yeah, this vulnerable, terrifying, domestic looking, emotional, pink dollhouse at giant scale is a monumental and important work of art. Still, still feels vulnerable. It still feels like, oh, nobody's going to take me seriously because it's not the giant thing. It's not the big and vulnerable um, political statement. It's this kind of socio-political, um, kind of deeply intimate statement, and the and the feeling that that will be in, implicitly and instinctively dismissed. Um, you know, it kind of feels like we're working at the level of like people's implicit bias. Like nobody wakes up in the morning and is like, I'm not going to respect women artists. And yet somehow we see through sociological studies that it still happens. And so for me, being feminist is really just saying, I'm going to respect my instincts and I'm going to show up as who I am and ask that that be respected. I One last question for you. If you looked at NFTs, have you thought about uh, yeah. releasing anything digitally? Yeah. Um, so I have, and I, I have some of my very old friends from college, um, are, have started a gallery called Super Chief, and they have actually helped me navigate the NFT world in a bunch of ways, including, um, you know, cause the, one of the main concerns is the, is the environmental impact of NFTs. And so they are, you know, they kind of started off doing carbon offsets. I think that they're still working on how can we move into different platforms that are, that are less, um, environmentally demanding. And so they, you know, while doing that, they, they helped me to figure out how the animations that I made could become digital pieces. Because I, I just made them. I never, you know, <clears throat> when when I first made them, 
you know, we even had decided like to not even try to sell them at all because I wanted them to be out in the world. I wanted them to be on YouTube. I, you know, I just, I wanted, you know, I'm very, I want people to see things. I want things to be accessible. And so the first time we showed them a dyke project, we didn't even try to sell them because we didn't want to limit them in that way. Um, but then when, when the NFT market started, they were, it was like, well, actually you can have it out in the world. It's just that this one object is minted as the original, um, you know, or the addition, but it's totally fine for this thing to be, to be shared and to be in the world. And so that really appealed to me. Um, and it became kind of amazing that I was actually able to support making more animations because I thought that it was just this weird niche, like thing I was doing that I was never going to be able to, you know, kind of make that money back and support making another one. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to have to let this go or figure out how to support it in some other way. And the fact that it's actually supporting itself is really wonderful. Yeah. Well, Callie, I, I think I've taken up more than the amount of time I'd asked for. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate because you. Because I'm so chatty no, once I get started. <laughs> no, but it's, it's fine. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I can have you back on and chat some more. I feel like I could just, you know, I think people find you, I, I think people find you inspiring. And, in you know, maybe well, six, you. maybe six year old Callie would have never have anticipated that. But I, I think it's true. And. I think I think you're. Oh God, that makes me want to cry. <laughs> yeah, and so I mean, I feel like you you've really grown into a leader. It's really amazing to think what you know what's next. And you know what? I also want to just appreciate you. You know that question that you asked about about feminism and the different questions that you're asking. You know, I think one thing that's really that's really great about this moment is to feel supported in having those conversations. You know, with folks like you who are you know I think that in in previous generations. Um, you know, a lot of folks who, who maybe, I'm just assuming your gender, but who maybe identify as male would, would, you know, not feel as like supportive of those conversations. And, and so I just want to say thanks for, you know, for asking that question and for being supportive of the answer. Cause, um, that's, that's just like one of the ways in which, you know, we're building, uh, kind of a better community of artists. Well, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's my pleasure. I, I really appreciate your time today and, um, thank you for joining me. Now, the news. Josh Baer is an art advisor and former gallery owner who seems to know everyone in the art world and has thus carved a niche for himself. In the mid-90s, Baer started paying closer attention to exactly how art auctions were shaking out. Baer started keeping track of not only who placed the winning bids at auction, but who got outbid. As an art insider, it didn't take him long to realize the value of the information and started publishing a newsletter of his findings via fax called The Bear Faxed. Well, fast forward nearly 20 years and The Bear Faxed is now an email, not a fax, and Bear has announced that he will be releasing a way to access the decades of sales data via a new database. Well, there are a number of art databases out there, most notably Artnet. But just about all of them fall short in identifying who the players in the auction are. This is actually very valuable information that can help an art dealer know who to target if a particular piece comes up for sale. Who wanted this piece or one like it but lost out? Well, there's your target. However, it's interesting that on-blockchain bidding for artwork provides the same information through a more timely and accurate means. Google is putting its technology might to good use by helping recreate images of paintings that haven't been seen in almost a century. The particular success stories highlighted in the art newspaper come from black and white photos of Gustav Klimt paintings thought to have been lost forever. The artificial intelligence has been trained by Google to understand Klimt's use of color and uses that intelligence to augment the vintage photos. The training involved asked the AI to look at more than 1 million photos of flesh, plus another 92,000 photos of paintings where an artist has painted skin, and lastly 81 paintings by Klimt himself, meant to help the algorithm understand Klimt's style. The resulting images provide us our best guess as to how the lost Klimt images might have looked. 
David Hockney calls the stir this week when he penned an op-ed piece for the art newspaper that proclaimed the demise of abstract art. Much of the article covers ground that the 85-year-old painter has laid out before in books like Secret Knowledge, but in the closing paragraphs he states that abstraction, I think, is over. It's run its course, taking away the shadows from European art. Figuration has rebounded in recent years, and there is a pervasive theme of narrative and identity reflected in contemporary work, but it's too soon to write abstractions obituary. In the book Reductionism in Art and Brain Science by Nobel-winning neuroscientist Eric Kandel, data is laid out that shows how our brains are stimulated by the search for meaning in abstract artwork. The less recognizable the forms, the more our brain gets excited. Things in the art world, as in fashion, are often forecast to be done with forever, only for time to tell a different story. I'm sure that abstraction, figuration, photography, digital art, sculpture, well, they'll all have seats at the table for decades to come. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, You can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.